Today we're going to calculate the enthalpy change from uh, two different methods. One is using heat capacities plus the heat of a phase change, um, like going from liquid to vapor or liquid to solid. Um, we also have a heat of formation method where we look at uh, a standard heat of formation, um, how much it takes to form that compound from uh, carbon, oxygen, elemental form and then uh, go up with heat capacities from there. So we're going to calculate um, enthalpy changes, okay, delta H, from both of these methods. And if we think about um, you know, heat capacities, when we're talking about heat capacities, and we see this molecule over here on the right that's, that's vibrating, um, it's how much you know, energy, energy we'd have to put into this molecule to get it to go up to a, a certain temperature. Okay, so um, temperature is, is related to the kinetic energy of the molecules. And, uh, you know, to do this versus, you know, let's say a diatomic molecule like, you know, O2, um, you know, how much energy would we have to put into, you know, this first compound versus a diatomic molecule like oxygen? Okay, so those are going to be different. And we can, um, you know, the heat capacity is a thing that we're going to use to say what is the relationship uh, between those two. Okay, so um, let's just go over a couple concepts. Um, first of all, enthalpy is a state function. We're going to go over heat capacities and then also uh, phase changes. And then we'll get into you know heats of formation and how to do this calculation in an alternate way. Okay, so um, enthalpy is a state function. So if I start here, let's say I start right here, and I come down and then over, this is on the pressure versus enthalpy. Um, and we looked at this as like on the refrigeration cycle. Um, you know, and, and so this is, if it ends up here, for example, there's a certain uh, temperature and pressure that correspond to, um, to that enthalpy, and it doesn't matter the path that it took to get there. Okay, so enthalpy is independent of path. Um, and then we always talk about delta H. We don't really talk about absolute enthalpy, um, but it's from some reference condition. And, and so one of the reasons why I mention this is that other tables, you know, tables report this reference condition differently, so don't uh, mix and match uh, tables. Um, you know, steam tables, for example, the zero enthalpy is at the triple point, but there's going to be other reference um, conditions. Okay, so let's just go over the definition for heat capacities. We know that that enthalpy is a function of temperature and pressure. And so if we just take a total derivative of, of this to get dH versus H, we know it's a function of temperature. So let's differentiate it with respect to temperature holding pressure constant um, times dT and then also differentiate it with respect to pressure holding temperature constant and then put the dp there. Okay, let's do the same thing for internal energy. Okay, so a du, I want du instead of just u. Okay, because I want to eventually get dh or, or delta h. Okay, it's a change in enthalpy. Um, so here I have du dt constant V. Now this one's a function of temperature and specific volume. I multiply that by dt. And then here is uh, d u dv, a constant t. And I multiply it by this uh, delta specific volume. So these two terms here, so this one is going to be heat capacity and um, with constant uh, pressure. Um, and then this one is CV. So these are two heat capacities just defined a little bit differently. Okay, so here's the defini definition for CP and here is the definition for uh, CV. So this is an isobaric um, uh, heat capacity and this is an isochoric or a constant volume um, heat capacity. And so for ideal gases and when we talk about ideal gases, okay, lower pressures and um, and higher temperatures, um, we're going to have D 
DH, um, this is our specific uh, enthalpy, is going to be equal to CP times DT. It's just uh, defined this way for ideal gases. And for uh, D internal energy, that's just going to be CV times DT. Okay, but for solids and liquids, we're also going to have uh, this term, which is the specific volume times delta pressure. Okay, so let's just let's just go on um, from here. So this is how we define uh, heat capacities. Okay, and uh, the important thing here is that we have a CP and a CV, and those um, are often different. Okay, um, and uh, the other thing to note, uh, let me just bring up one more thing here, is that these terms right here are generally uh, very small, okay, in relation to the terms just to their left. And so often we ignore those. Okay, so um, heat capacities, okay, sometimes we, we write a heat capacity because it's not constant with temperature um, that, uh, you know, it's, it could go up with temperature. So the higher the temperature, the more energy you have to put into it to get it to change a degree Kelvin, for example. Okay, so um, if this were just equal, if it were constant, just equal to like A, for example, um, then it would be linear, just be a line. But because um, we might have a positive B here, the heat capacity is going to go up over, uh, over, you know, with increased temperature. That this is going to then curve like that. Okay. Um, and uh, so what we do to get to get enthalpy, because dH equals Cp uh, dT, in order to get the change in in enthalpy, then uh, we just integrate this and going from T initial to T final. Okay, so or T1 to T2. Okay, so um, let me just erase that. Um, okay, so let's say we had this whole polynomial right here. And we want to integrate that. So this is the integral of that first term, second term, uh, third term and then fourth term. Okay, and then uh, if we look at heat capacity versus temperature, then uh, delta H is going to be, it's like the area under this curve. Okay, so how much it changes with temperature. Uh, we integrate that and integrating is like the area um, under the curve. Okay, so for ideal gases, one of the other things to note is that um, Cp equals Cv plus R. That's the ideal gas constant. And then for solids and liquids, Cp is approximately equal to Cv. But that's only for solids and liquids. Okay, so um, let's also talk about phase changes as well. So now we don't have uh, like a heat capacity, but we're just going to have a heat of vaporization, for example. That's the difference between the enthalpy of the gas and the liquid. It's how much energy we had to put into it per mass or per mole to, uh, to get it to vaporize. And then we also have a, a heat of fusion or a heat of melting. Okay, and that's going to be between the liquid and the solid. Okay, and then if you want to do the heat of freezing, uh, that's just going to be the negative of the heat of melting. And the heat of condensation is just going to be the negative of the heat of vaporization. Okay, so also we could find the heat of sublimation. That's going from you know solid to vapor. Okay, and you would just add um, the heat of melting and the heat of vaporization together to get that. Okay, so also one other thing to know if this is temperature versus enthalpy. Okay, so as we put in more energy to the system, this is the uh, temperature of the system. Okay, so we heat up the ice, it might be at you know, negative, maybe start at negative 20, heat it up zero degrees, you have to put in a lot of energy and see no temperature change. And then you heat up the liquid until you start seeing the first bubble, and then you vaporize that, that liquid, and then you start heating up the gas. 
Okay, so these are the phase changes right here. Okay, um, from solid to liquid and then liquid to vapor. Okay, so just remember that for a pure substance, temperature is going to be constant during the phase change. If you have a mixture, it's going to maybe go up over as the lighter compound gets boiled off. Okay, but for a pure compound, that's going to stay constant. Okay, so just let's just look at some tables because this is a good way to just get some of this data for particular compounds. Okay, here's our temperature of melting. Now that's going to be in degrees C. Um, there's the heat of fusion or melting. Um, and you can see this is kilojoules per mole. Okay, um, let's just look at, for example, acetone. Okay, 5.69. Um, here's temperature of boiling, and then here's the heat of vaporization. Now you'll notice that, you know, oftentimes um, the heat of vaporization is, you know, a lot more than uh, the heat of melting, um, and uh, you know, so that's that's certainly the case for water, but it's also the case for a lot of other compounds as well. Okay, it takes more energy to go from a liquid to a vapor than it does to go from a solid to a liquid. Okay, so also one thing to note is that um, you know these are at certain uh, pressures as well. And if the pressure changes, you are going to maybe get a different answer for those. Okay, so we'll show you that equation in just a little bit. Um, also, here is a qua uh, table of heat capacities. Okay, one thing to note is that you have different forms of this uh, equation, so just be careful for that, especially when you encounter these twos right there. Okay, and then uh, here it's also the state. Okay, so this is a heat capacity, but only for a liquid or a, a gas. Okay, um, and uh, here's the temperature unit. Okay, again, it changes. I don't know why they didn't just put it all in one unit and convert them, but nevertheless, there are uh, different temperature units as well, just to watch out. Um, and then also one other tricky thing is that um, they didn't want to report this as 123 um, times 10 to the minus 3, for example. So they just reported this as A times 10 to the third. Okay, and so this is equal to A times 10 to the third is going to be 123.0. And so to get A, you're going to have to uh, divide by 10 to the third. Okay, so that's going to be the value of A. So that's just one other thing that's kind of tricky about these uh, charts. And then also, you also have a temperature range. So outside of the temperature range, they may not have data collected, and so you may not want to go outside of that uh, temperature range as well. Um, okay, so um, okay, so I just I mentioned that about the A value. Um, you know, and then use that use this multiplier at the top of the column. Okay, so uh, also there's other um, databases. You know, they've empirically fit uh, heat capacity um, versus temperature, and so here's just another form of that equation. It's just C sub P is a function of temperature, but just a different function. And if you have to integrate that. Um, you know, you still get an uh, exact uh, analytic solution to that, but um, you have uh, you know this derivative right here that you have to use if you're using this correlation versus like a polynomial. Okay, so that's another form. You might have a D or an E term as well, uh, but this would be for the Dipper database. Okay, so here's specific enthalpies uh, for select gases. Okay, so that, um, you know, different temperatures. Okay, one thing to note though, as I mentioned before, different tables are gonna have different reference temperatures. Okay, so this one's using 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. Okay, doesn't match table B1, for example. Okay, here's another one, table B9. Now check out these reference states as well. Different, 77 degrees Fahrenheit, and one atmosphere. So we can't mix and match tables. That's the main thing here is that you've got to watch the reference temperatures because it's always a delta H that we're computing. There's no absolute enthalpy. So they use that um, 
you know, at 77 degrees, they define their zero enthalpy. Um, so just also note that uh, there's some taboo equations as well. Okay, and then here's COPS rule. Oh, I almost hesitate to show this to you, um, you know, but you can uh, approximate the heat capacity just by summing up all of the elemental contributions. And here is, you know, here are the different elements, and so you can kind of construct an estimate for a particular compound. Let's say there's not data for that compound for heat capacity, then you can use this, but um, you know, only use this out at last resort. You know, last resort um, use COPS rule. Okay, so here's a couple different ways to estimate the heat of vaporization. Okay, heat of vaporization uh, could be a function of the boiling temperature. Okay, another uh, Chen's equation is a function of the boiling uh, temperature and then the critical temperature and pressure. Okay, you also have the Clapeyron equation. It's a function of the vapor pressure. And then um, this final Watson's correlation, heat of vaporization versus temperature. Okay, so changes in temperature using a critical temperature. So here's some equations in your textbook um, that you can go and look at, but really these are just methods to approximate um, the heat of vaporization and how it changes maybe with temperatures. Okay, so here are just some simplifications. Okay, normally heat capacity is a function of temperature, for example. Okay, here's just a polynomial form of that. But um, sometimes we just get lazy. Okay, so it's not a very strong function of temperature um, sometimes. And, um, you know, especially over low temperature ranges, um, so sometimes we just use an average heat capacity and then uh, you know, use um, you know, the change in, in specific enthalpy is just C sub P times delta T. Okay, so we just use this as an average right here and uh, we're typically going to use this on exams. So we don't want to necessarily test your integration skills, we know, you know how to do that. But this just simplifies it quite a bit, and you can get somewhat accurate solutions just by using uh, this form. Okay, so let's say you're doing balances with a lot of different species and a lot of different heat capacities. Um, so these might be the A, B, and C for each uh, species. For example, C sub P equals A plus B times T plus C times T squared. Okay, and but you have those for a lot of different species. Okay, so you can just use this uh, formula. This is the integrated function. Okay, so delta H equals, um, we've integrated C sub P dt, and then um, we are summing up the outlets and the inlets, and so that's how you can use the A, B, and C, and then we've integrated uh, the temperatures for each of those. We assume that the A, B, and C's are constant. Okay, so let's just go over another way to calculate a change in enthalpy. But this is through heats of formation. And uh, what we're going to do is calculate this delta H as um, a function of temperature and, and pressure. Okay, so we can use a heat of formation, how much it, energy it takes to form that compound from pure elemental substances, okay? Um, like, uh, well actually we do diatomic molecules like nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and then carbon, which is in graphite form. So it's how much um, the, the change in enthalpy to form any compound from this combination of compounds. And uh, at 25 degrees uh, Celsius and one atmosphere. Okay, we'll typically do that. So one of the things that we can do is, let's say we have, um, you know, we want to calculate change in enthalpy, then we can calculate uh, the heat of formation of, of each of those compounds and then just take it from 25 degrees up to the new temperature. Okay, so these are tabulated in table B1. So let's just go there to table B1. And we looked at 
these before, okay? But one other one is right over here. It's the heat of formation in kilojoules per mole. So it's how much um, change in enthalpy is required to form that compound in that state from, um, from those elemental uh, uh, compounds uh, or diatomic molecules like nit nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Okay, so here you can see gas, liquid, gas, liquid. So you have gases and liquids in this table as well. Okay, so um, example, let's calculate the enthalpy change for acetone going from vapor at 65 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere to liquid at 25 degrees Celsius and five atmospheres. Okay, so let's go ahead and first of all use a path method using uh, delta H of vaporization and one atmosphere and T boiling. Okay, and then we're going to do another method where we use the heat of formation method. Okay, so we want to go from acetone uh, vapor to acetone liquid, from one to two. And we want to calculate the change in enthalpy for that. Okay, but we don't have the, uh, the heat of vaporization um, at that temperature. So what we'll do is um, we'll just use our heat capacity to first of all go down to the temperature around which we have the heat of vaporization. Then we'll go over with our heat of vaporization and then we'll heat it, um, then we'll actually cool it back, cool it down, okay, to 20 and, uh, and then go up in pressure as well. Okay, so change in temperature and change in pressure and change in phase as well. So it's a state, um, so it doesn't matter the path that we take. Um, but the reason why we had to go down in temperature is because this is where we had the heat of vaporization. Okay, so for the first thing we're going to do is just go ahead and take it from 65. You put your starting thing on the bottom and then your ending at the top. And that's going to get to 1A. Okay, then we have our um, heat of vaporization. Now it's going to be the negative of that because we are going from vapor to liquid. Okay, and then we're going to go ahead and, and cool it down from 56 to 20. And then we are going to use um, this for liquids. It's a specific volume times delta pressure. Okay, we're just going to integrate that, that last term. Okay, so no change in temperature, but just a change in pressure, for example. Okay, so then we can compute, um, you know, just add all of these different steps up um, and, uh, and then go ahead and compute the total change in enthalpy. Okay, so um, here's the final equation just with everything plugged in. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this with the uh, heat of formation method. Okay, so this one, um, we're going to go ahead and just do look up the heat of formation of vapor and then we're going to integrate up from 25 degrees where the heat of formation is reported up to 65 degrees okay and then we're also going to do for two we're going to use the heat of formation of liquid from our tables and then go from 25 degrees to 20 degrees and uh, and then we'll also put in the change in pressure there Okay, because the heat of formation is at one atmosphere. Okay, so then we just combine those two together to get H2 minus H1. Okay, and um, you get the same answer that you did before, but we're going to use these heats of formation instead of doing um, the different steps like we did before. Okay, so there's the um, heat of formation or this is the heat of vaporization at 25 degrees. So just um, the difference in the heat of formation of the liquid and vapor, that was equal to um, the delta H of vaporization. So we got the same answer as we did using the PATH method. Okay, so bottom line is you should know uh, both methods to get um, delta H. We need to know the PATH method and the heat of formation method. And then just remember that delta H is just part of this energy balance that we've been looking at. Okay, so problem solving. Um, when you solve something that needs mass or mole balances and an energy balance as well, 
um, one of the things that we can try to do is first of all solve the material balances, you know, mass or mole, and then we write um, an energy balance, dropping out uh, you know appropriate terms. We'll choose a reference state like 25 degrees Celsius or zero degrees. Um, we'll look at the tables. Okay, the tables will often tell us what our reference needs to be. Um, and then uh, we'll find uh, delta H or delta U for our system. And then we'll find these other values from our energy balance um, and solve the energy balance. Okay, so this is a problem solving approach. Often you can do the mass or mole balances first and then solve the energy balance. Okay, so let's just um, go over a couple questions. Um, what is meant by the statement that enthalpy is a state function? Okay, so um, we reviewed that early on in the slides. Let me just go back to that. So enthalpy is independent of path. So at particular temperature and pressure, you're gonna have a particular enthalpy. Okay, and then let's go back. Um, what is heat capacity? Um, so heat capacity, when I think about it, it's, it's how much energy it takes to um, heat up um, a particular substance uh, like a degree Kelvin, okay? So um, it's, it's how much energy you have to put into it um, to get it to rise in temperature. Okay, so for water, let's draw a uh, graph with temperature on the y-axis and enthalpy on the x-axis starting from ice and proceeding to steam, labeling the different portions of the line. Okay, so just from before, um, okay, so we had temperature and then enthalpy. Okay, and uh, you know, start from maybe uh, subcooled ice. Okay, we heat up that ice and, uh, and then we reach a temperature of melting. And then we have to put in a, you know, some energy there. The temperature's gonna remain constant. Get to a liquid, we're gonna increase in, uh, in temperature as we heat that up. And then we're gonna start to vaporize it. And then we, once we vaporize that, and then it's gonna start heating up again the vapor. Okay, so Labeling the different uh, points, here's our you know, temperature of melting, here's our uh, temperature of uh, vaporization, here's our delta H of vaporization, there's our delta H of melting. Um, and uh, then this is you know, liquid, and that is vapor, and this is going to be solid. Okay, so how do you use the heat of formation uh, to calculate enthalpy? Okay, so um, it, it's really a change in enthalpy that we're gonna be calculating. Um, and so if we just go back to uh, this slide, let's go right here. We just um, take the, the delta H of formation plus the heat capacity to get to a specific enthalpy for any compound. Okay, so that uh, concludes this lecture. We just remember we um, are calculating an enthalpy change from two different methods, and uh, we need to know how to use heat capacities, but also these heats of formation. Um, you know, some some warnings there about you know, reference temperatures uh, from different tables, um, and uh, and just one other thing with this, you know, don't forget that. You know, heat capacities, this is just how they're defined. Okay, so, um, and this is how we, we derive those. Okay, so this is kind of used for convenience, but this is how the, uh, the heat capacities are defined.